it's really important that students have um, um, math elasticity where they can, they just can recall without any trouble five times five, um, um, you know, or three minus four. You know, they need to be able to uh, just recall those things. Hello, my name is Shane Saxon, and I'm here with my guest, Mitchell Holly. And Mitch and I are continuing a series that we've been doing on the liberal arts, getting back to the basics, the curriculum of classical education. And the last few episodes, we've talked about the trivium. We've done an overview of the liberal arts. We definitely recommend going back, listening to any of those if you have not listened to them so far, and then come back and listen to this one. Today, we are getting into the quadrivium. Now, before we get there, Mitch and I owe some debts of honor that we <laughs> just need to air out on the podcast and just make sure that they are known. And really, the, the only way to illustrate this is to talk about a great tradition in literature um, that was started by Homer. Mm -hmm. And in the Odyssey, there's this character who is unironically named Mentor. And he is the mentor of Odysseus. Um, and he's Odysseus' friend, and he plays a very important part. And this, this guy named Joseph Campbell from a, a couple of years ago wrote this book about this pattern in literature that you see quite frequently where the main character will often have a mentor named after this friend of Odysseus in uh, the Odyssey who leads them on their adventure and gives them a lot of, of tools and skills that they need before they go <laughs> off to be able to conquer whatever mission they're being sent on to, to get the elixir and to go to the underworld and to come back and, and, yeah. and learn more about themselves in the, in the hero's journey. And so my, my favorite example of this, of course, is Obi-Wan Kenobi. Luke Skywalker in, in episode four, he's on Tatooine. And who does he meet first? Crazy old Ben, Ben Skywalker, yeah. Yeah. who teaches him how to use the lightsaber and gives him all of the skills and tools that he needs to eventually face his father and, and rise to be a hero. All that said, <laughs> everything that you and I know about the Quadrivium, basically, we have learned from Paul Schaefer. Yeah, Paul Schaefer, who's the headmaster of the Online Academy, I work with very closely, share an office with. Um, you know, I, I always joke with with uh, people that uh, you, everyone should have their kind of closet metaphysician. You know, when they have existential questions about right. who they are in the world and uh, what's what's what really is good, uh, they need to be able to call that person and straighten things out. Right. And for us. Paul is that person as it relates to the quadrivium. The risk is you're going to get an hour on cows or or grass yeah, feed. Yeah, because he's a farmer. Yeah. But but the benefit is that we know all the things that we know. Right. Yeah. Either he'll you know either he'll be able to relate uh, the quadrivium to farming, um, <laughs> or or he'll you know talk about what he believes to be the greatest novel ever written, which is The Count of Monte Cristo. Right. Um, so you know the, the, it's a mixed bag, but uh, we. Uh, <laughs> that we owe great debt uh, in terms of our journey to to a guy like Paul. So let's get into it. What is the quadrivium? And, and maybe it would be helpful to back up and do some distinction making as it regards liberal arts, kind of like we did in our very first episode, just to set the stage for the quadrivium. Yeah, so the very first um, episode, we, we kind of set the liberal arts in the context of an education. We said that um, at its broadest level, an education includes both the arts and the sciences. Mm -hmm. And we define arts as skills from the Latin ars. Um, now, there are a lot of different skills though than just the liberal skills, right? There are um, the manual or the utilitarian skills. Manual from the Latin manus meaning hand, right? So skills that require like carpentry mm -hmm. or sewing or cooking, those are manual skills. And then there are, so that's the, the, the manual arts or the utilitarian arts, but then there's also the fine arts, right? Sculpture, architecture, painting, dance, right? Those are all, those are the fine arts. And then we're talking about, you know, today we're talking more of the liberal, liberal arts. A key distinction to help us see the difference between these is that for the manual arts and there are the utilitarian arts and the fine arts, the person who performs those arts are making some sort of product. Mm. And that product can either be a means or it can be an end, right? So uh, if you're a carpenter and you're planing wood, you know, that's a manual skill. 
you're creating wood that's flat so that you can use it to build. So it's right. a means, creating means. Um, or the fine arts is creating ends. Mm. You're, you're creating a beautiful something that's beautiful, that's true, that's good, and that exists for its own end, right? right? right. Whereas, um, so in each one of those cases, the agent is, per is performing these skills to produce something. Well, in the liberal arts, the agent is performing those skills on himself. Mm -hmm. Or herself, uh, the student is acquiring those skills um, so that they can be a better uh, uh, have uh, be a better student, be a better human. Right. Um, and so there's a uh, there's a there's a real important inward focus to the uh, to the um, to the trivium especially. But as we get to the quadrivium, we're beginning to step outside of the self, mm. where. Yes, the quadrivium are still skills that we are internal internalizing so that we can perform those skills with greater competency. But now we're beginning to to take a step out and look at the natural world as well. Um, and so, um, you know, this and this gets into the the you know our first of the um, uh, of the first uh, kind of skill in the quadrivium. Yeah, and I, I think I've often heard the illustration from that's borrowed from English grammar or linguistics used to, to describe this difference between the manual arts and the fine arts and the idea of transitivity, which in and of itself might need to be explained, but once you've heard it explained, it's helpful. That is, a transitive verb is a verb that has a subject and an object. So, you know, I throw the ball to Mitchell is a transitive. And so you'd say that there are transitive arts. Those are the ones that produce something. But then there are also intransitive verbs, and those are the verbs that don't have an object. So I sit would be intransitive. So you could say that the liberal arts are intransitive because they, they don't produce something. They work um, on the person. The subject is affected by um, the, the verb. But Greek helps us go even a step further because <laughs> Greek has this pesky thing called the middle the middle voice right. in its transitivity, yeah. which means that the that the verb is subject affected. Yeah. So historically, the classical tradition had said that the liberal arts are intransitive uh, in the sense that they, the, the subject is undergoing an action. Well, in Greek, we have this idea of the middle voice where there are, it's not just verbs can be more than just active and passive verbs. And this is just an analogy, right? Right. Like, right. Verbs can also be what's called um, subject affected. And if, if the verb is subject affected, then it occurs in the middle of voice. And so ideas of like emotion and cognition, you tend to, if there's a verb in Greek that it's of, uh, you know, emotion or cognition, it's probably going to be in the middle of voice, like uh, phobeomai, to fear, right? Or um, kathemai, to sit, right? Those are, it's a state of verb. Um, it's expressing what the agent is doing. The agent is fearing, the agent is sitting. Uh, and so it uh, maybe, and I do think Plato actually brings this out when he's talking about the arts, because Plato is kind of caring for this idea that maybe we're, it's not just that the liberal arts are intransitive, but they're actually subject affected. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, they are, they exist in the middle voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's turn to the quadrivium. The, the first of the quadrivium that we would look at, and we'll look at two today, um, would be arithmetic and music. So could you define arithmetic and music for me and, and define why they get grouped together? Yeah. So arithmetic, um, as, uh, as our mentor has, has explained to us, <laughs> um, and, and taught us, uh, um, and as the classical tradition teaches us is, um, the study of discrete, uh, quantities or discrete numbers. And then the study of music is now applying that study, that skill, to what you find in nature. Mm. Um, and so, you know, learning quantities and uh, adding quantities together, subtracting quantities, um, you know, by discrete numbers, what I mean is they exist by themselves, mm -hmm. right? Uh, whereas, you know, the, you, there are some math formulas that, that can't exist in discrete quantities. They have to exist as a continuous group, and we'll get into that later. Um, but... Um, so yeah, so that it's 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 a cultivation and the ability and the skills required um, to uh, to quantify uh, right. discrete numbers. So how does arithmetic? How does it come up in, in the classical 
tradition in curriculum specifically? How are we teaching children in arithmetic? How does how do the liberal arts, specifically the quadrivium, anchor our educational practices? Yeah, so it's really important in the early years uh, to um, make sure the students understand arithmetic. Right. <laughs> you know, it's really the only one of the few important things on the quadrivium side. Right. Obviously, we're working on the reading skills, phonics, things like that on the lang on the trivium side. But on the quadrivium side, one of the most important skills from kindergarten really through sixth grade is um, is just the study of arithmetic. You know, so um, it's really important that students have um, um, math elasticity where they can they just can recall without any trouble five times five um, um, you know or three minus four you know they need to be able to uh, just recall those things and I'm always amazed you know when I look at HLS the Highlands Latin School uh, or even students in the online academy uh, with Memorial Press um, and how quick and fast they are um, with their math facts with their and they are very elastic with their with their knowledge you know they can they can do long amounts of drill sheets in, in just mere seconds where, you know, uh, it's, you know, someone who typically what we see is a, um, a devaluing of an emphasis on arithmetic because there are people, you know, institutions or, or, you know, philosophically math programs are trying to rush towards algebra or they're trying to rush towards geometry. And they're really skipping the solid foundation you need to kind of develop over five, six years mm -hmm. Um, in arithmetic. Right. So my question then is how does that practically affect the curriculum that you choose when you're considering how to teach arithmetic from kindergartners to sixth grade? Yeah, I think there's a lot to consider here, but on a very basic level, I, I you know, in just terms of low hanging fruit, you know, number one, we're looking for a math, an arithmetic program that is going to be a developmental, uh, that's going to, you know, pay attention to the fact that we, we need to have a mastery based approach as a student is developing. Mm. Right. So right. cumulative from beginning to end. Basically. Right. Right. You know, so, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when you, there's a couple different probably methodologies in terms of, you know, uh, how textbooks will approach math, you know, the two typical ones would be a sort of mastery based approach and then a spiral kind of math approach where in, uh, in a spiral math approach, then, you know, as students are learning, you know, as they go up to the next lesson, there might not be any sort of logical connection between right. um, what they're learning in lesson one and le lesson two. But um, the idea there is that you're kind of always circling back. And eventually by circling back in that review, then you're able to cover a large majority ma of material. Um, and so, you know, what's nice about that is that you can cover a large majority of material, but one of the real downsides of that is that it doesn't allow students to see the logical nature of math. Mm. It doesn't allow students to um, really dig deep and right, master the right. skill. And so, you know, what I would say, you know, one of the critiques I would say is, you know, what is the value of, of being a, a mile long and an inch deep? Mm. Wouldn't we rather be a, you know, a mile deep, right. you know, really master it um, and take a little bit longer on our arithmetic. Right. Have and that elasticity. Yeah. And that's why, you know, um, you know, circular programs tend to get to pre-algebra pretty quickly. Right. Uh, where, and, and, and I think we would try to say that it, there's value long term in uh, delaying, you know, till seventh or eighth grade, you know, pre-algebra and then you know, focus fo really focus on kindergarten through sixth grade on on those math facts, on arithmetic, on on being able to manipulate discrete quantities. Right. Um, there, you know, our founder Cheryl Lowe, uh, and this, you know, she there's this quote that she said that I always bring up um, that we tend to overestimate what we can do in one year. Mm. Um, and underestimate what we can do in five, six, seven right. years, right? And, and the idea there as applied to this discussion is that um, we tend to overestimate what we should be doing in, you know, up through sixth grade with math. You know, we don't need, they don't need to be doing pre-algebra necessarily in, in sixth grade. Uh, we can we can delay that and tr imagine how much great, if you have a good foundation, right. imagine how f much further you can go, um, you know, in over the, course of 12 years in an education. Yeah, it's funny you bring up Mrs. Lowe because there's a, a thing that she said about arithmetic that's always hung with me as well. I was watching this video that she did at a conference back in 2005 about math, and she came up with a goal for the students in the sixth grade as to how elastic those math facts should be. Because at sixth grade, that's you, you've you covered all of the arithmetic principles, and you're about to make that leap into, into algebra. And so 
theoretically, students at the sixth grade should have the highest level of, of math fact mastery possible. And so she sat down and did a speed drill and timed herself. Yeah. And that was the goal for the students in <laughs> sixth grade. You know, and I and I've just always loved that that was her approach. So with music, what what's the relationship between arithmetic and music? Yeah, so music, uh, in terms of its classical definition, when we think about music, we're, we're primarily thinking about uh, music theory. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we're, ta we're talking about the application of the study of, of discrete numbers, discrete arithmetic, um, and we're applying that to nature. So a great illustration of this, one that I'm just recalling Paul in the office telling us about this, um, is Protagoras, right, who took a string and, you know, he played the string and it made a certain noise. And he noticed that if he cut the string into thirds, the the tone that the string made mm -hmm. was harmonious. And if he cut it in half, it was har harmonious. But if he but if he cut it in like three fifths, right. then, then it was not harmonious. Right. You know, it, it didn't sound good together. And so quantifying what an octave is, you know, it's a step up by eight, you know, or... All right, and then, or in music, you can also count up by threes or fives or whatever. Um, is the is the the theory behind that is just is just the application right. of discrete of discrete numbers. Yeah, it's a, it is very interesting. I, I to me, this is kind of the magic of math a little bit, in that is it doesn't really, if you think about it, it doesn't really uh, make sense. I guess. If you're only thinking in a totally materialistic, physical way, that notes that are eight part eight steps from each other have the same same pitch in a sense, but in a, in a way that correlates mm -hmm. every eight. Mm -hmm. Like there's something about that that is so unique, and that's the symmetry of the universe. That there is the symmetry that you can go sixteen steps apart in our tonal system. And those notes correlate in a very particular way that notes that are 15 steps apart don't. Mm -hmm. It's those little uh, little observations that make up, I think, some of the importance of music theory. And it's not that music outside of music theory isn't important, but in the quadrivium, we're talking about the way that the universe is ordered and the way that that can be quantified to discrete number. A, a school without music, as we have in the HLS course catalog, is a, is a school without a soul. You know, music yeah. is extremely important for what it is in and of itself. But as a bedrock to our curriculum, I think it, the points that you're bringing up are, have always been really interesting to me because it just shows how uh, how beautiful God's creation is and that the study of math doesn't just have to be the dry, turgid memory of right. facts. It is that. Right. It has to be that. Yeah. But it also is just seeing the beauty of God's order. Yeah. You know, so... You know, Cheryl Lowe used to also say that, um, you know, learning isn't fun, but it's joyful, right? Mm. You know, so uh, learning math facts and, you know, drilling five times five may not always be fun. But when you apply arithmetic to the study of nature, you get to you begin to see kind of in 3D now mm. uh, the beautiful ordered creation that is around us. And so, you know, these skills this is why the skills do operate on us. They help us see the true, the good, and the beautiful in ways that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see them. Um, but that kind of only happens when you take those skills and then begin to apply them to the natural world. And that's what math music is doing for us. You know, and you know, obviously we could sit here and talk about how you know we could you know, the great um, you know uh, movements of classical music and. Uh, you know, Wagner's cycle of, of operas that are all worth listening to. Um, but, but when we look at the theory behind those things, it's not just the music themselves that is uh, has a poetic beauty to it, but it's actually the theory behind the music that actually has a beauty, has a, a poetic nature to it as well. Uh, and so it, it's going to cap music and the study of music, um, specifically in this case, what I mean by that is the study of, of the natural world through the lens of arithmetic. Um, is a way of seeing the true, the good, and the beautiful in a way that's not possible without the cultivation of these skills of, of arithmetic. Yeah, well said. So that is our first part on the quadrivium. So we've talked about grammar, logic, rhetoric. Today we talked about arithmetic and music. We are moving on to our final episode where we will talk about uh, geometry and astronomy. And so catch us next time.